Hi, my name is Magicians. How are you? So it's been a while since I've actually had a podcast guest because I've been traveling, I've been doing Spanish in Mexico, all that. But if you've just joined us, then hello, my name is Vangile Makwakwa. I help women of color heal ancestral money trauma so they can fall in love with their bank accounts, increase income and live their best lives. Actually, I help all women mainly because my guest today is is Catriona and she's one of my clients. (laughs) She worked with me, I think about two years ago, right, Kat? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was 2019. Wow. So Kat and I started working together in 2019. We worked together one-on-one in our one-on-one sessions for six months. And I've been meaning to interview her forever because she's now doing epic, epic work in um, creativity and just like you guys have heard with like almost 90% of my clients she helps she also in the middle of our coaching changed her career did like a completely (laughs) different thing so we've already established that this is kind of like a common thing with me and when my clients work with me so yeah (laughs) right so Kat Please tell us about yourself. What do you do and how do you define yourself as a soul? Mm, what a beautiful way of posing the question. <laughs> Thanks, Van. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And it's just really an exciting moment to start this conversation with you and to have other people at the table with us. Yeah. So... My full name is Katriana Tauris. I am now a full-time artist. I have a studio practice. I make sculptural and textural artworks from materials that I collect from the forest and from trees that are in the environment around me here in Cape Town. Mm. And as I'm sure we're going to unpack further in this conversation, my my reconnection with my creative practice really enabled me to have a great sense of aliveness in my own life. And that has been so transformative for me that I also work as a, as a creative coach and a teacher. I work to support people to overcome all of the doubts and fears that come with a creative life so that other people can also make their their ideas and their inspirations a reality and I I love that work too oh man this is so so awesome I love it um so Kat what what does money mean to you how would you describe money to an alien Hmm. (laughs) so I would say that in in my life money is the tool that enables me to have the life I want to live Mm. and it's it happens in the context of of exchanges um, and it enables me to grow and develop my creative practice, which is the thing that I want most for myself. Yeah. I, I think there are a lot of um, hang-ups that come around money and the arts. So for me, it's just the most simple way to see it. This is something I need to survive. To I need to nurture my relationship with money because when I nurture and attend to my relationship with money, it's pieces of my life fall into place in ways that in absence of that would would just not happen. Mm -hmm. That's just so, so powerful. I love that. I love that so much. So Kat, When did you start suspecting that your relationship with money wasn't about money and was about so much more? (laughs) Like, 
Why did you decide to come through and be like, Van, can I work with you? <laughs> Ooh, so it was really clear to me in, in the moment that I kind of sought you out that I needed to deal with a lot of feelings of guilt that I had in my relationship to money and and that those things were about me as an individual they were also present in my family and in the kind of culture that I grew up in I and that those feelings of guilt that I had about money and the money that I earned and the money that was sitting in my bank account were just leading to some very unhealthy practices. I was not able to have a conscious and fully embodied relationship with the money that I had. And wow. it was really leading me to feel very unhappy. And mm -hmm. It was preventing me, that guilt was preventing me from really having the control of my life that enabled me to do what I really wanted to do. Um, mm, mm. Yeah, I was playing small in terms of yeah. my relationship to my own dreams and the yeah. things that were really calling me in my heart. Yeah, yeah, wow. I think that we are, most of us often do that. And then we call it practicality, you know? We call it being practical because that's, that's what everyone thinks, right? And like, I'm feeling called to actually ask you when you were in the process of making the shift, especially transitioning from being, I think you were already on track if you weren't already a tenure professor to yeah. now yeah. doing this, like, what did that feel like? Because it was in the middle of our work where it was like, I was not on the yes, cat. you should stay in this job. It's pretty safe. Cause I mean, hello, you'd have a job for a lifetime. And how, what are some of the things that were going on within you and that did you receive, I'm very interested. Did you receive any kind of, um, I guess like feedback from others that you want to go be an artist. Like literally you're going from one of the safest jobs <laughs> to one of the most uncertain jobs. <laughs> you have just like, you've hit the crux <laughs> of the matter on the head with this line of, of questioning that you, you're giving me here. Because Art is the antithesis of that which is practical. Yeah. I have started to understand that to be an artist is to be, at least in terms of one's life choices, to embrace the impractical, to yeah. embrace what many other people would say is just entirely unreasonable and irrational. Mm -hmm. um, and you know this because you know my story you accompanied yeah. me through this just I mean phenomenal transition in my life yeah um, I get goose pimples just even kind of going back to those moments in the sessions that we shared um, and it was scary like I want to acknowledge to people listening to this because guys I mean, you can imagine Kat would never have had to worry about ever losing her job or any of those things to this, what is considered, as she said, impractical. So the fears that come up with that, just it's really, really scary. And I think it's scary for all of us. Like if you're trying to be, go from, I have a proper job to I want to experience the world and travel and be a nomad, there's an element of risk, there's uncertainty. Mm. And I think to be, to, to be an artist is in many ways to live in a very explicit relationship with that uncertainty that is actually a fundamental truth for all of us. Mm. But 
please can you unpack that you just mm. said something so powerful you said it's a very the answer uncertainty is a very fundamental truth for all of us i get yeah. what you mean but please yeah. unpack it more because i think so many of us work so hard to create certainty so that we never feel that uncertainty and then we fool ourselves into believing that we can always have certainty absolutely absolutely i i think about it particularly in the context of the pandemic that we've just been through because mm -hmm. that was the moment where you know my contract as an as an academic came to an end and mm -hmm. so there was an intense period of uncertainty for me but it was also happening at a moment where people throughout the world were understanding that the decisions that they made that we were all making we all make as human beings to try to protect ourselves from the uncertainty of life can be turned upside down at any moment and they mm. and, and that risk is beyond our control mm. so i think about it in the context of the pandemic i also think about it in the context of you know if anyone many of us have have lost a person unexpectedly um the nature of life is uncertain we never know when when death will happen we never know when mm. you know something entirely unexpected will happen and it's a challenge to to seek a conscious relationship with that uncertainty and i i mm. feel that it's it requires practice yes one of the things i've had to learn as a as an artist as a freelancer is is to strengthen that muscle of trust and faith mm. often it feels entirely unreasonable that <laughs> <laughs> i'm 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 walking this line between sanity and insanity doing that but i do yeah. believe that it's a, it's i'm doing that from a place of truth and honesty with mm. myself and and with the world as well Mm, mm. Wow, wow. I love that. Um, and I guess my next question is to say, has uh, taking the step to follow your dream and be a full-time creative, has it helped with that relationship with uncertainty? And how have you navigated that? Mm. It has helped it. It has helped it. It is very scary. It was very mm. scary. Um, I just want to go back to that moment because it's it's imprinted in my consciousness. Um, <laughs> you know, the moment where you asked me this beautiful question, you said, you know, if you weren't dealing with all of these stories that you have around money and, and the pain and the trauma that has been carried in your lineage, who would you be? And I remember that I could, I knew the answer immediately. I knew yes. that the answer would be, I would be an artist. If I could release all of that worry, I would be an artist. Yeah. I also knew that if I was to say that out loud, I had to do it. And that was absolutely yeah. terrifying. That the idea yes. that I would have to live with all the uncertainty of being freelance, of being a creative was terrifying. The second time you asked me and you prompted me and it was so um, it was so guys this that, is in our coaching session yes. that Kat is referring to so if you're like when did you ask this it's during the coaching <laughs> yes yeah I think it was like session two or three it was very early on in the journey um yeah and I crack my clients asked, right open and ruin their lives right early in the journey guys <laughs> But let me tell you, the second time you asked that question, you probed because you were not going to allow me to say nothing. And thank God you're so fantastic at your job. It landed like a ticket to freedom. I was like, oh, my God, if I say this, then Vangile can help me do the work that I need to do to make this happen. Mm. And that's what it's been like you know we did the work together in the remaining sessions and I felt confident that I could do this 
I was able to understand that my journey in life, our journeys in life are like the concentric rings of a tree, that everything mm -hmm. I have done prior to this moment is the foundation upon which I build. And Whew, that's true for all of us. It. Yeah. And <laughs> I work with trees. So the, these are the paradigms I use to understand life, yeah. my own life and the nature of what it means to be human. And so as much as that uncertainty is present, I feel a sense of, of alignment and confidence. Mm. And I've seen that alignment manifest in my ability to, to survive and thrive <laughs> post-contract yeah. post -contract job, you know? Yeah, like, Kat, I have watched you go from this person I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if I become an artist? This is so scary. To being this person who now helps other creatives birth their dreams. Mm -hmm. I've been to your house, you now own property. I've seen your studio. I've seen the work that you're birthing, which I've said to you is like nothing I've ever seen before. You know, it's so, so incredible. And I think that I guess most people are wondering, can you tell us about the journey that you've had to walk? Because let's not, apart from the risk, art and the relationship with becoming an artist boils down to money for most people. It's that I am going to starve to death. So can you walk us through that journey of what was that like managing that relationship with money? Did you have tensions? And then what are some things you wish you had known about money before now? <laughs> that, now that things that you know now that you wish you had known before. Mm. So I think that that notion of the starving artist is so present in our communities, in our societies. Mm -hmm. And you really helped me to work through that. And that has been, that has been very helpful to, to just see the possibility of being an artist beyond that starving paradigm. Yeah. Because part of that is, you know, part of it is just, is, is thought patterns, is, yeah framings and there are plenty of very wealthy artists yeah but we don't get told about that yes. when a child goes to a parent and goes I want to be an artist it's oh my gosh you're going to starve you need to do something that is safe and what I found ironic and it's something that I've had to constantly I've been sitting with this is that in our notion of what safety feels like in our world, we never ever take into account the safety of honoring yourself, the safety of not betraying yourself, what that feels like. So what we then create in this world, what most parents and teachers create unwittingly is adults who have learned not to trust themselves, who have made it a point to keep betraying themselves. So Right now, we have a lot of adults that say, I don't hear my own inner voice. I don't hear my intuition. I don't know what I want because they've been so trained not to hear that. And then we call that safety, but then at the expense of like us having so much spiritual trauma, so much issues with the divine and our mental health eventually being affected in the long run because there is a link between the body and the spirit and emotions, right? So you keep betraying your soul. There's a price to that. You know, there's like such a deep price. And that eventually does start to affect us and our emotional well-being and our mental well-being. But we call that safety, you know? Oh so, yes. and then we call that financial safety. And we wonder why 
we have the adults that we do, why we're adulting and relationshiping the way that we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, <laughs> if we were in the same room and if this wasn't a podcast interview, I'd be banging on the table, you know, <laughs> just in appreciation for what you've just said. Um, I, that sense of being safe in myself because I am living my truth oh. is is incomparable mm -hmm. and I often I, I often say that it's hard mm -hmm. the choices that I've made to live without the certainty of a salaried job mm -hmm. to be taking a dance for creativity in a world that doesn't value that in the ways that I think it should is mm. is risky. Yeah. But and it's hard, but there is nothing harder than getting up every day and living a life that doesn't feel true to who I am. Really? That hard <laughs> that hard. I won't do it again. Yes, I, I'm 100% with you. You know, mm -hmm. I get it. Like, I feel like most times the journey, the decisions I've made to travel, to um, live the way I do, sometimes it feels impossible. But then when I try to do anything else, I realize that that's actually harder because it's not true to who I am. So that hard is not a heart that I want, right? And I guess this is a question I don't think I've ever asked on this podcast, but I think it's so relevant. How has that learning, how has that honoring your inner voice and honoring what your soul wants, how has that built self-trust with yourself and how has that self-trust impacted your relationship with money and business? Mm. Mm. <laughs> You know, it's made things, I would say, almost magically appear in ah, my life. And I'm talking about... Magic! Yes, exactly. And I'm talking about that in terms of money, in terms of relationships, in terms of possibilities. So, you know, I, I had a savings plan um, after our work together and I remained in academia for a while in order to build up the financial cushion I would need in order to take the, the risk of, of, of leaving a job and trying to build a business and eventually make money from my art as well. And I didn't really have by the time you and I finished working together one-on-one, -on -one, I had a sense of the skills and the offerings that I could use to make an income for myself. And I, I should also kind of take a short diversion to explain that I think you and I were wonderfully aligned in understanding that creativity and creative expression in the artistic sense will struggle to thrive under financial pressure. So Amen to that. was, was Amen. never <laughs> to feed myself from my art directly yes. and early on. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, yeah, and I'm so grateful that you understood that. I think yeah. I was very lucky to, <laughs> to work with you in that sense um, yeah. because not everybody understands that. Um, and I know now that I'm going to make money from my art, but I am so yeah. glad that I have had time to explore and to take creative yeah. risks and to develop a relationship with my material mm -hmm. um, because I've built a business on the side. So I was yeah. saying, you know, I didn't quite 
know what that business would be, but something about the trust in myself, the, the trust in my journey and the trust in being part of a bigger picture. Yeah. I can't really describe it (laughs) more concretely than that, but just that sense of, (gasps) of, of being in alignment and flow enabled me to understand people came to me and started to ask me you know how did you manage to do what you've done can you teach me and it was I didn't even have to set that intention to for example become a creative coach my clients made me a creative coach And you know why? I think people don't understand this because this is how I started coaching with money as well. There's a difference between intellectually understanding something and talking about something and going on live videos, which is all important to building a business, right? And being the embodiment of that. I always say people can sense when you are the truth, when you are living that truth, they can feel it. You know, and even your clients will trust you. There was no reason why you had to trust me. And I was like, Kat, you can do this. We can work on this. You can build a business. You don't have to rely on your creativity. There are so many ways that you can be a full-time artist without having to make your art be the thing that pays you because there's so much pressure when we do that. I don't think, I think the big thing with artists is that when you demand that that should be the thing that makes you the money it can block a lot of other avenues of money coming through but beyond that it can also put so much pressure for you to create in a way that is not in alignment with your soul and the magic truly happens when we align with our spirit right So what you're talking about is you became the embodiment of the thing that you teach and people sensed it and they were drawn to it. So when you are the embodiment of a thing, you're literally, your energy just calls to the clients, (laughs) you know? Yeah. 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 It's been, it's been such a joy and it's that, that I return to when I, I'm feeling the uncertainty of my life choices acutely. It's that Mm -hmm. that I turn to, to kind of soothe myself and reassure myself because, you know, I don't want to pretend that I don't feel that sense of uncertainty, that it doesn't frighten me. But as Mm -hmm. I said to you, I'm, 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 I have chosen that for myself. Mm -hmm. I have chosen to live in truth with, with the uncertainty of life and to to create art from that place and yes sometimes it's scary so I have to learn to to develop a set of tools to get through those moments where it feels difficult and and let me say one of the things I've observed is that my the kind of ebb and flow of of fears that I have around my ability to sustain myself is yeah. not is not really about the digits in my bank account it's never about the money yeah. okay so people have heard me constantly say that you now need to unpack that <laughs> <laughs> it's so it took me a while to suss this out because <sighs> I think even though we'd worked together and I knew that mantra and I could see how that truth manifested for me in the context of being a salaried academic, it showed up very differently in this new chapter. It took me a while to clock it. And I I just realized that it was about how I was feeling about myself. It is, let me not speak about it as if it's in the past. It is about how I'm feeling about myself. And yeah. sometimes I feel in this like joyful relationship with myself and my abilities. And sometimes I don't feel like that. And it's in moments where I don't feel like that, that I start to worry about my finances. Um but yeah, that is not, that's, that is in no correlation with like, yeah, the balance in my account. 
And that's when the kind of self-soothing comes in, mm. you know, where I'm able to say, I'm able to look back and see the, the magic really that has happened yeah. and to count, to remind myself that I can count on that. Yeah. And to remind myself that fundamentally I have everything I need. Mm. Mm. So, so powerful, right? And I think that when we rely on the digits in our accounts, like when we, ref when we um, correlate and conflate safety with how much is in our bank account, we can spiral when that bank account dips below a certain amount. And I think there's so much power in not doing that, especially as now you're an artist and an entrepreneur, and there's so much uncertainty in both these fields because it can stop you from making decisions that you need to make for your business from really following your intuition because everything in you will say no because the bank balance isn't going, isn't um, supporting this or the money is going to run out. So I've seen people be stuck in the same situations for years because they keep waiting for that balance to shift to a place where they feel safe enough to A, leave the job, to a, B, launch the business, to C, set the resignation date and work towards things. And it will be years and years before they ever feel that to hire the creativity coach, to hire the money coach, the trauma coach, nothing because they're waiting that one day that balance is going to be the thing that makes them feel safe. And guess mm. what? The safety comes from within. We self-resource, right? Yeah. So it's such a huge and powerful thing, which leads me to ask, you've been telling us about being a creativity coach. I don't want to ask this at the end. I want to ask this now also. Can you tell us what you do with other people? How this journey to change careers, become a creative full-time has birth this new business and what this business now does? Hmm. Thank you for asking. <laughs> because it's, it's uh, that work is as important to me as my creative practice. And these kind of two aspects of my work are in constant and beautiful and fruitful dialogue mm. with one another. Um, so as a creative coach, when I'm working with one-on-one -on -one clients, I am helping people to identify that, <laughs> just as you said, it's, it's never about the money. Making yep. art is rarely about the skills needed, supposedly, to make the art. Wow. So it, my work is about helping people to overcome the fears of, not being good enough to make art, to build a relationship with their own creativity so that they can understand that our self-expression as individuals is inherently valuable and it is needed mm. in the world. The way I understand creativity is it's a force that enables us to, it's a force and energy that enables us to make our ideas happen. Creativity is often seen within the domain of artists exclusively, mm -hmm. but that's really not true. Creativity yeah. is for all of us. We all close our eyes and dream at night. You know, the images mm -hmm. that our consciousness pulls together tell us that we have an imagination. And all of yeah. us use that imagination to a greater or lesser extent to shape our lives. And creativity is the force that enables us to imagine and to act in line with our imaginations. Um, so, you know, many people will imagine themselves getting married and they will create a wedding that is in line with this kind of childhood dream they had. And it's creativity yes. that enables them to do that. For other people, wow. it's about dreaming that they could make money from 
uh, selling a food product that they love and taste delicious to them. And it's yeah. creativity that enables that dream to become a reality. So yeah. as much as I work with creative people who might want to write a book or who might want to make artwork that they can put into a gallery one day, I also work with individuals and groups of clients to enhance creativity in the context of a workplace, mm -hmm. uh, to find new ways of relating to one another, to find new ways of doing things in an organizational context as well. And I think yes. that creativity and a, and a confidence in creativity is what will enable workplaces to thrive individuals mm. and workplaces groups of people mm. Mm. I'm so glad you said that because I think that we've almost limited creativity to the arts we don't mm. see creativity in business you know even run, being an entrepreneur is a creative venture you know, it's about knowing how to tap into creativity, to be able to think of new ways to market things, to be able to think of new ways to do graphics, to produce things, etc. Creativity isn't just limited to the arts, right? And I think that most of us have just shut down to creativity, which is why I'm so fascinated by um, the work that you do. So let's say that someone is not a creative, <laughs> right, at all. You're not a writer, you're not a poet, you're not a performer, you don't paint, you don't draw, you don't sculpt, you don't dance. How do you work with that person to help them tap into their creativity? I feel guided to ask that question because I feel like someone will be listening and just being like, but I don't feel, because people always say that to me. They're like, but I don't have a creative skill. I don't have any kind of hobby. I'm like, no, you have something. You just don't see it as creativity. Yeah, it's a really good question. I, um... I would say that not everybody likes to cook, but many of us like to cook. Many of us like to make ourselves like a cup of tea or something. So, you know, cooking, creativity is, is essentially bringing something that didn't exist into existence. So mm -hmm. if you take mindful pleasure in creating a cup of tea, that is just going to hit you in just the right spot. You're using your creativity. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, this question you've asked me touches on another really fundamental component, which is mindfulness. Creativity mm -hmm. enables me to, it, my, my own creative practice is very uh, repetitive. So a mindfulness is a big part of the way that I work. I'm often doing the same thing over and over and over again for days and weeks on end. So not what we think creativity is, Kat, because we think that it's a new thing every single day. <laughs> ah, and this ties in so nicely to that observation you've made, ties in so nicely to what I've been learning about creativity in some of the most creative um, companies in the world. So Pixar, um, the, the animation company is, I think has been rated one of the most amazing creative organizations in the world. And one of the things they say is that as a philosophy, they invest in people and not big ideas. So they invest in gifted people who they trust will not necessarily produce one groundbreaking idea, but will who yes. be ideating all the time, who will be creating yes. and having ideas all of the time, some of which will be terrible and some of which yes. will be amazing. And it kind uh. of brings us back to the kind of the, this idea of like the cup of tea and, the, yes. and, and how, I think people who aren't creative or who don't have a creative hobby or practice will often say, 
I'm not good, you know, I'm not good at this thing. I made one drawing when I was six and it was terrible and everybody laughed at me <laughs> and I thought I had no gifts. Well, I yeah. would say if you make yourself a bad cup of tea, do you make that mean that you're bad at making tea? No, you're like, oh, that was not a good cup of tea. It didn't hit the spot, but next time, surely I'll do better. Yeah. And, it's and most of us would idea. actually go on YouTube and be like, I want to make a particular cup of tea. How do they make this? Like when I was learning how to make chai tea, I asked my friends in India, like I went online. I, I really perfected chai tea, you know, like from scratch with like the spices. I now mix it up. But I didn't go like, ooh, I'm terrible at making chai tea. I just assumed. I've never had, like, I've never made chai tea before. I've always had chai tea, but I've never made chai tea from scratch with all the spices, everything gone to the market, gotten the spices. But so what you're talking about is so, so true. <laughs> and that, and, and it requires a level of, of mindfulness and self-awareness because mm -hmm. as we go through that process of learning something new, and that is, you know, those are the gifts of, of a creative life. You know, mm -hmm. you, to go back to this beautiful example you've given of, of the making of the tea, right? That challenges come up along the way. Uh, we can't get the right spice or mm -hmm. we made it too sweet or it was just so incredibly spicy, it was undrinkable. <laughs> yeah. And we have to be aware of our thought patterns that come up as yeah. we embark on the risks of learning something mm -hmm. new, the inevitable failures that come along the way, the ways that we make those failures mean something so enormous that some days we might feel like, we are the failure. Like I didn't make a good yeah. cup of tea, so I am a failure and being mindful. Yes. Um, and that's a lot of the work that I do with one-on-one -on -one clients is enabling people to identify the dialogues that come up when they sit down mm -hmm. to try to write the first line of a new chapter of this book they are dreaming of, or mm -hmm. they want to start making a new painting and all of the things that come up. So it's about mm. being in mindful awareness of that and doing it anyway, no matter what. And doing it anyway. It. Yeah. I love mm. that. I love that because I think what we tend to do is we tend to confuse the, I am not, I'm still learning how to do this with the fact that I should be perfect at this. And when I don't get it right, the first few times I fail. Like I've been one of my clients yesterday, we were talking about this in uh, the Wealthy Money Mastermind was this thing where she was like, well, I feel like I've been sending out all these emails. She chose a marketing strategy and things didn't work and things didn't work. And I was like, tell me the results that you've gotten. And I was like, that's a higher industry average than what is considered average in the industry. And she was like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, because what we tend to do is I think that we live in a world that where we see everyone's end result. And a lot of things are so unrealistic. We don't know the process. So what we do is when we are in process, we assume that everything that we're doing is wrong. And then the, that's the story that trip us. We create a story. We create a dialogue. And then we make that a reality. And then it stops us. And not only that, because I'm just thinking for me, I used to do this because I have a history of abuse where like if I don't do things perfectly the first time with my mother, I was told I was useless, I was pathetic, I was good for nothing. So as an adult, it's been a lot of work with trauma and coaches and my nervous system to allow myself to fail to do things incorrectly often and constantly and to have to sit with that voice and to hold myself through it and I mean I won't lie I've had tons and tons of support with professionals that know what they're doing right and like with trauma-informed coaches and all that but it's that. And I remember the day in a coaching session with one of my coaches where I had this realization that I'm not failing, I'm learning. 
And because everything for me, the stakes were so high growing up that if you don't do it perfectly, you're going to get beaten up. You're going to get shouted at. You're going to get screamed at. As an adult, everything that feels like it's not, that felt like it wasn't going correctly or it wasn't perfect would bring up that same kind of nervous system response. And I would then start to just spiral because I'd go into survival mode because my entire existence depended on that, right? And I keep thinking that, okay, my experience is extreme, but I see with a lot of clients how even our schooling system, because it was like that, if you didn't pass and you didn't get a straight A, then, oh, my God, you're probably like your school career is in jeopardy. Your life is in jeopardy. Then you're known as that D student, C student, etc. And it has affected so many of us. So, yes, my experience was extreme, <laughs> but most of us are carrying a lot of that because we were constantly graded. Like, I mean, and we all have different learning times. It doesn't mean that you're terrible, but because you're put in a class system, you have a quarter to learn this. If you don't learn it in this quarter, then you're not gifted. You're, this is not your subject, you know, and you probably just needed more time, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I am... Um, you know, speaking about failure and the expectations we place on ourselves and, you know, what that looks like in, in my field as an artist and a creative coach. I had a, I listened to a beautiful interview on a podcast um, where a professor of neuroscience, I think, was talking about creativity and how it manifests mm. in the brain. And they did this really yeah. interesting um comparison where they they described the kind of the muscle of creativity uh, in using the example of a, of the gym and how you know the majority of people who go to the gym are not thinking about becoming an olympic athlete but yeah. there's this sense of understanding that training being active in our bodies is good for us no matter what mm -hmm. and that and that sense of value is exists beyond the the failures that will come along that way right it's the failure to mm -hmm. turn up at the gym when you not feeling yourself you know the failure yeah. to increase the weight you're lifting or the number of reps yeah. you're doing um the failure to become an olympic athlete you know none yeah. of these are we could say that they're failures, but they're not failures. They're just part sure. and parcel of what it means to actively engage in, in, in a level of physicality in our bodies. So I would say mm -hmm. the same of creativity, that I would love to live in a world where people understand that exercising the kind of, <laughs> exercising a creative muscle has value beyond the professional arts realm and that I believe that that kind of approach would enable us to to work with failure in a very different way um, mm. because I also think that one of the gifts of exercising a creative muscle is that we inevitably have to embrace failure it's just part and parcel of the work part and parcel right and I think it's in every aspect of our lives but we live I think the sad thing is that we live in a world that doesn't teach us how to embrace failure but actually shames us for failing you know we shame the students that are not straight A students we celebrate the straight A students we celebrate the jocks we celebrate everything that is perfection but the people that are trying and are not at perfection don't get recognition so we we live in a world that says you either win or you don't like I keep hearing people talk about like all I do is win-win and like you either do there's no try right that's one of the famous sayings and I'm just like for you to be able to do you need to keep trying what the hell is this 
You know, yes. so it's totally okay. But because we live in a world like this, it's it's affecting us so deeply. It affects us from doing things. And we don't even realize that we keep re-traumatizing ourselves with these beliefs. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. So my second last question, Kat, is what are some of the three lessons that you learned from us working together, <laughs> be it about money or trauma, <laughs> any of that that you feel have had an impact on your relationship with money and shifted your mindset around money? So the first one that comes to mind, and it's not because we've already referenced it, but because it's <laughs> been so true to my experience, which is that it, it's never about the money. Yeah. And that lesson just enabled me to expand. Yeah. Um, to find freedom. Mm. And yeah, so that undoubtedly is 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 the biggest um the second one understanding that the stories that i have around money that i learned growing up that i inherited have enabled me to understand myself better um mm. to understand the blocks that I had, the fears that I had, and which, you know, cyclically come back as these things do and continue mm. to work on them, notice them, try to tell a different story. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that those, that I understand myself within a bigger picture. And I think that's really, it's very beautiful and it's a gift that, I received from you that I don't know if I would have been able to receive that had I worked with a coach from England where I grew up mm -hmm. to understand that I am an individual yeah. and I sit within a lineage and that yeah. that lineage has shaped who I am. Um, yeah. And I was able to find a way to exist with that truth and with the guilt that I experienced as a result of, of kind of living in a sense of dis-ease with that mm. part of, of my identity and my story. And mm. um, so that was really, that was a really big one too. Yeah. And then I think third is that the principles that you taught me through our six months together, the principles that you work with um, mm. around the importance of my inner child, of honoring my inner child, of yeah. honoring a future self that enables me to dream and to feel confident in my ability to make my dreams happen. Um, yeah. My relationship with the critical side of my psyche, those... Yeah those principles are that dictate my relationship with money are also the principles that dictate my relationship with my creativity so there was this lovely oh. integration to use your word earlier there was this <sighs> integration that happened um that i that yeah that it enabled me to to develop a healthy relationship with my finances it also mm. enabled me to develop a healthy relationship with my own self-expression and, and my art mm, wow I love love that you said this <laughs> you know I think it's absolutely powerful and absolutely incredible so Kat I feel like you've given us so much and people someone is listening and just like I want to connect with this woman I'm a creative, or I feel like, and I think this is true for most people, I feel like I've been stifled creatively, 
how do I access that? How do people get hold of you? How do people work with you? Mm, come and work with me because <laughs> uh, there was something you said earlier um, that made me think of Carl, Carl Jung's idea of the unlived life. So, you know, if, if, if people are feeling that urge to live a more creative life, I will say, come and work with me or indeed anyone who will allow you to release that burden of an unlived life. Um, yeah. because that stuff is real and that gets passed down yes. generationally so cool. if that's you and you want to work with me then um you can find me at my website um which is www.katrianataurus.com apparently if you search artist coach trees forest bar <laughs> i come up you don't even need to remember how to spell my name <laughs> I love that. Um, Artist, coach, trees, park. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, on my website, uh, there's a sign up link. I run an email community called the Creative Circle. So even if you don't want to work with me um, directly, I like to share fortnightly pieces of creative inspiration and wisdom um, and some kind of my experiences and how that relates to the principles of, of a creative life. So you can sign up there. And then, of course, I'm on Instagram. I'm an artist. I have to be on Instagram. Um, yes. Katrina.an.t. Van, will you put the these links I in will. the show Definitely. notes or whatever? I appreciate Definitely. I have a difficult difficult <laughs> spelt name I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it but you get what I mean yeah yes no guys please if you're watching this on YouTube look in the description everything is on there look in the emails if you're on the wealthy money mailing list um look on um if you're listening on Podbean iTunes or Spotify please look in the description all cats details will be on there so, wow, Kat, we made it just right on time because I know you have something else scheduled. It on flew. To it just flew. And, you know, I'm not famous for holding to time, but I was like, spirit, make it happen. So thank you so much for coming through on the show. And everyone else listening, thank you for joining us on the Money Magic Podcast. There'll be another episode next week. Listen to all the other previous episodes. But also, if you're listening to this and you're like, this sounds incredible. I want to do this money work. I want to figure, I want to have like the experience of like healing my money trauma and just moving past and starting to live in alignment with myself. I do have a free seven day training program. Um, it's called uh, seven day, uh, Tapping Into Ancestral Money Wisdom. It's a free seven day training program. It has meditations. I have guided exercises. It is absolutely incredible. If I do say so myself, people message me all the time. They message my client onboarding specialist about it. And you can join that at wealthy-money.com forward slash training. Again, wealthy-money.com forward slash training. Or you can go to wealthy-money.com and just shoot me a message if you'd like to work with me. Unfortunately, I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one working online, one-on-one -on -one coaching anymore online, but I am taking people for one-on-one -on -one work to fly to where I am in the world and work with me in a curated VIP retreat. It's very yummy. We do we, we do daily exercise, we do daily massages for seven days, we go on trips, we do pleasure work, we do coaching together. So after seven days, you walk out not just feeling refreshed, but with so much clarity and incredibleness. And I can see Kat is like, wow. Yeah, it's really, really awesome. I have a private vegan chef. So we also 
work on our food and eating healthy. It's incredible. I have one spot for that in Mexico. You get to choose your seven days between now and September. And then I'll also have, I also have a spot for when I'm in Costa Rica in October. So yeah, just hit me up. Thank you guys. I'll see you again next week. Kat, I'm going to let you go. You are incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much.